Hi, welcome everyone to another one of Quang World Mobility's live benchmarking sections using the Zoom webinar platform. Our theme today is all about wrapping up this terrible 2020 and starting to anticipate 2021. My name is Hazel Chen and I'm the Regional Marketing Manager for the Greater China Region at Quang. I'm based in Hong Kong and happy to be supporting this event today. Before we get started, I just want to give you a couple of tips. First, please note that for those of you with ERC's CLP or GMS and GMST certifications, today's section can be counted towards your certification maintenance. The seminar ID number is 16425. 16425. Second, I want to ask you to please look out for our QR code at the end of today's event. Your feedback and input are important to us, and this will help us to plan our future events. Now, I'm happy to introduce to you today's moderator for our benchmarking and our panel discussion, Quang World Mobility's Lisa Johnson. Lisa is the global practice leader for consulting services at Quang. She has been with Quang for eight years and is responsible for our perspectives, articles, and industry research. Lisa and her team also support our clients with their mobility policies and program strategies. She is a leader in addressing innovations and shift impacting the global mobility industry, including the diversity mobility, linking mobility to talent strategies and assignment ROI. Lisa has been recognized with ERC's Distinguished Services Award and has been on the faculty on the GMST certification program. She is a frequent speaker and regularly published across our industry. Lisa, I'm going to hand things over to you now to introduce our great panelists today. Thank you so much, Hazel, and welcome everyone. We are delighted that you're here with us and we are looking forward to a great session. Um, we have two fantastic panelists that are going to be joining us. And so let me start with Elizabeth Keller, who is the head of international mobility and immigration at Standard Chartered Bank. Elizabeth has been working in international mobility for 18 years and started in the manufacturing industry, supporting Caterpillar Inc. and then moved to financial services. She's now at her third global bank, having previously worked for Barclays, Capital Bank and Goldman Sachs. She's married with three children and has lived in Singapore for six years. She is also a self-confessed avid fan of Korean and Chinese dramas and loves to read. We are delighted to have you, Elizabeth. And also joining us on the panel is Mira Srinivasan. Mira is global mobility manager for, she is global manager for employee mobility, performance and reward at Treasure Wine Estates. TWE. Mira is a senior HR professional with more than 10 years of experience in the areas of remuneration and benefits, global mobility and expatriate tax compliance, gained from both professional services and industry roles. During her career, Mira has been accountable for a wide range of activities, including expatriate, equity and employment tax compliance, global compensation and benefits reporting, and broader global mobility and reward consulting. She has a strong interest in inclusion and diversity and currently leads the Australia New Zealand Inclusion and Diversity Council at TWE. We are delighted to have both of you here today and Mira and Elizabeth, if you would both take yourselves off mute and pull yourself in on the video and we will get started. Hi Mira. How are you? You're you're on mute. We're going to take you off mute. Hi, Mira. Hi, how are you, Lisa? I'm um, good. Thank you for the good. lovely introduction. Um, yes. I'm going to also just confess up front, I'm really hoping that my dogs don't bark in this call. So please bear with me to put myself I think I think flexibility is a big part of who we all are right now. And uh, most of us are working from, from home or have been. So uh, no worries on that end. Hi, Elizabeth Keller. How are you? Hi. Very well, thank you, Lisa. How are you doing? 
Good. Just so glad that you're here and so glad that we're all, you know, able to uh, hear each other and see each other. And I told you all the audience, so we're delighted that you're here and we do have this fantastic panel. So um, let's, let me just share with you quickly the, how this today's session is going to work. Some of you have been on past um, events like these that we have had, where we have live polling with the audience and we have a panel discussion. So we're gonna start with a brief panelist view of current priorities. Just get Mira and Elizabeth's view on you know, where, they, where, where their mind is right this minute or at least in this week or this, this month here as we move towards the end of the year. And then we're gonna have four, four polling questions for you, the audience, in between panel discussions, debriefing it, sharing the Mira and Elizabeth sharing their views on each polling question as well. And we're going to save time for some Q&A right at the end using the chat function or the Q&A function, which we'll be able to see. You can add your comments or your questions as we go, but we will wait until the end in order to address them. And we'll see how many we get through and, uh, and um, leave you wanting more. <laughs> so um, we will we'll hold the questions un until the end there. So let's get started. Now, as I mentioned, Elizabeth and Mira, I want you to uh, give us a minute. Uh, you can see the word brief there on the screen. So we're going to go with brief. But I do want you to give us a minute on what's most on your mind today in terms of priorities or what's taking most of your focus here um, almost a year into this pandemic. Um, and just share with us something that is, is prescient um, for you right now. And Mira, why don't you start, please? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the biggest challenges from an operational perspective this year is just lo the logistics of moving things that seem seemingly straightforward. In 2019 are definitely not the case this year. Um, what has been front of my mind today um, and probably for the last at least a month is... Um, immigration restrictions, particularly with China. We have um, fairly large contingency of um, employees in China and a few expats over there as well, and are facing unprecedented delays in getting visas issued at the Australian consulates for China. It's probably not too surprising with the current geopolitical situation that we're facing, but right. it does definitely make things harder from a business perspective. Well, and it's so um interesting when you, that you always have to take in the geopolitical pieces as well as just what you know how to what you know what you know what to do you know how to do it but then there are these variables whether it's a pandemic or a geo, geopolitical confrontation or something else that becomes a barrier in itself yeah and absolutely. elizabeth take us a little bit into your priorities right now uh yeah thanks um i guess i'd probably is uh, COVID, as anyone would would probably expect. Um, of because of our network, um, we actually started uh, looking at COVID and our response to COVID uh, back in January, uh, because we have a significant foot footprint in China, uh, where the, where uh, it, it appeared to have started. Um, so we actually have a program at the bank, which is for personal requests to work abroad, um, and so. Um, what has taken up a lot of our time has been managing people who either were displaced by the initial outbreak of the pandemic uh, or subsequent to that have looked to uh, continue to travel, usually because of, you know, humanitarian or mitigating circumstances like bereavements, illnesses, etc. Um, so my programme, which is actually three years old, um, went up 935% this year. Um, so we have now facilitated over 2,000 people uh, moving around the world for their own reasons. So it's not business driven. Uh, it's because of, you know, family commitments, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's that's um, essentially started a whole new job uh, for for my team. Um, and now with the concept of flexible working, remote working, we believe that that program is going to go from strength to strength and continue to become very popular with the bank world before I think some people perhaps didn't find their way to it. Um, and for other people, perhaps working uh, remotely when that was overseas didn't seem something doable, but but now feels like it is. So we we um, we we expect to continue to see that program go from strength to strength. 
Um, in terms of BAU, our normal working, um, we're down 35%, uh, which is not insignificant, but it's not as bad as we thought it was going to be. So despite having a global recruitment freeze uh, and a pandemic, we still appear to keep moving people. So um, BAU is still there for us in the background. And then we had a number of uh, initiatives or projects uh, that we didn't want to lose um, sight of, even with the, the, the other work that we had. And that included a sustainability project uh, where we're looking to see and work with uh, vendors like Crown as to how we can reduce our, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, emissions. Okay. Yep. Yeah, use better, use better uh, packing materials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and uh, we also brought in um, some new initiatives around DNI to make uh, all of our all of our uh, program language very inclusive, so people immediately can see that this is something where depending on how they identify, whatever they see as, you know, something in their life um, that may or may not have been uh, an embargo for them going overseas, um, that they should hopefully see that that isn't. Um, <clears throat> and then we also had our virtual vendor summer uh, summit this, uh, this summer. So every year we get all of our vendors together in a room and uh, we either pull out things that are of particular interest uh, or we talk about how the program within the bank is going and how we can work better as a move team rather than individual uh, vendors supporting the bank. That is great. And I know uh, some of my team members were a part of that summit and uh, that, you know, I think we all take on things, um, you know, seeing what we can continue forward with and, and launch ahead with despite the current situation. And we're gonna have a chance to talk about DNI and just um, as part of our discussion a little bit further along. So thank you for sharing that, that sort of you know, snapshot into, uh, into both of your um, priorities and, and your lives right this minute. And it's a, actually a great segue. You're, you're talking about how you know, remote work uh, which had maybe existed already at Standard Charter and now it is something that you know is meaningful to to all of us in one way or another and we've just finished up our um, uh, updating our, uh, our a discussion that we started the year having around duty of care and mental health and um, I've just finished updating that, looking at the impact that this year has had on that conversation. And it's actually a silver lining that I'll, I'll share more about later on as well. Um, but a lot of the work with my team in consulting services has been around getting uh, both Crown's virtual assignment policy as well as some of our clients' virtual assignment policy and work from anywhere policies together. So definitely um, a good segue into our first polling question. We know that uh, many of you are out there listening. And so let's kick it off with a, a poll for you. And then we'll have, bring our panel back in to talk about um, how it goes. So Hazel, if you would bring down our first poll, um, certainly virtual assignments has been, you know, the topic um, during this pandemic. However, I do think that the definition of it was all over the place for a long time during this year. Uh, and it's now finally coming to some consensus in our industry around what it is. So for you in the polling, if you would just take a look here and select one answer, which of these definitions most reflects your organization's current thinking on virtual assignments? Is it for existing assignees who are temporarily working from outside their assignment locations due to COVID related travel bans or other barriers? Uh, is it an assignment approach that will last beyond the pandemic for an employee in country A to fill a temporary goal role, sorry, in country B with no travel assumptions built in? Is it perhaps both or something else? So I'm just asking you to pick one that most reflects your own or your organization's uh, current thinking around virtual assignments. And we'll just take a minute and get some of those answers. Um, and as I was saying, I think that the, the, the definitions were definitely um, varied as this conversation started earlier this year when you would join meetings and webinars within our industry and people were talking about virtual assignments. Um, it was a, a you know, sort of future of mobility and yet mobility wasn't necessarily included and what did it mean? Now I feel like the definitions have narrowed 
a lot. And we're seeing not only in our organization for our employees, but many of the um, companies that we work with are putting their own policies in place around virtual assignments. Hazel, have the, have the, have the poll results come in? Or do we need a few more seconds? Here we go. Our audience has spoken. All right, so 25% of you are focused on it being really just a stopgap, a bear, something where these dislocated or displaced assignees are able to continue with their assignment role without being in the assignment location. A small number of you are seeing that it's an approach that will last beyond the pandemic and it's really about someone in country A and going into doing a role in country B without relocating. But 55% of you, more than half, are saying that it is both. And there's a small number of you who are saying it's something completely different. So you're still in the very definition and I'd love to hear about that at some point. And you can type in your definition of that. All right, so we have the audience speaking most or more than half are saying that it's either the first or the second response, some combination of those that, um, so now let's take, bring you all in, uh, Mira and Elizabeth. They say you're on mute. Oh, yep, I just noticed, sorry. Um, and let me bring you in and Elizabeth, I'm gonna start with you. And if you would talk to us about virtual assignments. So we're gonna move on to remote work, but right now just focusing on this concept of virtual assignments. Um, are you surprised by the results of the polling? What about at Standard Chartered? Have you all talked about this, the virtual assignment concept? How far has that gone? Tell us a little bit about where you are with this topic. Okay, so um, for us, virtual assignments is, is nothing to do with COVID or, or a um, response to COVID. We used our other program, uh, which is the Personal Request to Work Abroad, RTWA program, uh, to, to manage um, you know, this year, basically. Um, virtual assignments for us is, is a new program that which we'll we're launching next year uh, and which will be just the concept of um, people who want to, um, what other might otherwise would have been a, a, a physical assignment, um, but for uh, various reasons, and we will put those principles together as part of the, the way the program will work, uh, we will determine that that actually will be a virtual assignment rather than a physical assignment. Um, and then for us, uh, virtual assignment could be sort of two things. The first thing would be just, you know, as I mentioned, what otherwise would have been an STA or even an, uh, an LTA uh, potentially in the future. We're going to we're going to restrict it to STAs, so anything up to twelve months to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that would be just out in the business. Um, but at the bank, uh, we are also launching next year a concept called Talent Marketplace where people can actually go into a marketplace, hence the name, where um, you can look to join projects or, or give your time um, because you want to uh, you know, try something new or you want to um, uh, brush up on a skill set or something like that. Uh, and it will allow uh, people leaders who, who have a maybe a short term or, or um, you know, uh, talent need rather than bring in a consultant or an external person will be able to look out across the whole of the global network and say I need somebody to give me two hours a week to work on you know uh, presentations uh, I, might, right. I haven't got the stat skill in my team does anyone want this work and uh, we're, we're looking to determine whether if somebody is, is um, working between particular locations or for a particular amount of time, whether that would trigger any compliance issues for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, we would, we would sweep th those up into virtual assignments as well, despite it being a slightly different animal than somebody who's doing effectively a six month ma maternity cover. Virtually. That's right. And that's one of the examples that we have in our policy of um, our, the virtual assignment policy that we're creating as well of, you know, filling in for someone who's out. Great. Mira, take us into uh, TWE and uh, what you all are thinking about in terms of virtual assignments. Is it something that you're talking about? What, what's the thought there? Yeah, I think yes and no. Um, I think that the definition that we have adopted at TWE is actually quite similar to what Elizabeth has at Standard Chartered, 
in that we are using the terminology for when, or we're probably part of the minor, minority with the survey results. So I was a little bit surprised, but applying that definition specifically for when um, individuals are working on projects that where they would typically be based in another location, but are doing it from the location that they're permanently based in. Um, so I think that was option B in your list. Um, it is something that we are talking about. Um, it's something that has probably just happened organically as a result of COVID more and more this year. I mean, I heard of an example um, in September, October, where we had one of our winemakers based in the South Australia region who was assisting with our Penfolds um, harvest season in France. I don't even know how that can happen <laughs> as a wine. Mm. So it is definitely something that I think that we're pushing the envelope on. But in terms of developing a formal policy, um, we're, we're not there yet. Um, not yet. Probably, definitely more focusing on the remote working on people that are moving cross borders and um, flexing anywhere as the, the terminology that we use um, with COVID. Excellent. So that's a great segue for us to move into the next topic, which is re international remote work and work from anywhere. And, you know, I, I want to define it in, in, in a few ways and, and the, the way that we're looking at it and you all can share if you're looking at it in different ways is really fulfilling your existing job, but not in the country where you were hired. It could be temporary or it could be permanent. Um, and so I put three examples here because they reflect some of the examples that some of our clients have brought to us and even within our own organization. And so I just quickly want to give these three examples. I'm sure there are many, many more, um, but this is for international remote work from anywhere. So Zoe wants to work from her vacation house in Phuket, lucky her, uh, but normally she's based in Kuala Lumpur. So she said, I'm just going to, I want to be based there in my, in my vacation home. Christina was hired to work in Prague as a local employee. She's originally from Russia and wants to be near her family during the pandemic, but to continue with her job. And then we have George and George and his partner want to travel around the world while continuing to work, uh, become a global nomad, become a digital nomad. Um, so in, as I'm looking at this with some of the organizations that we work with and even within our own organization, you know, the starting place for me is that a company at the end of the day has to decide what their philosophy is around remote work before creating any policy or guidelines. You know, is this something that is possible? Is it something that we embraced before this even, before the pandemic anyway, uh, which there are many companies who have that, ha already had that? Um, or is it something that just isn't re feasible within our corporate culture? Um, so let's get the audience back in and let's do another poll before we bring in uh, Mira and Elizabeth to share their, their thoughts on this topic. Because again, it's just been such a hot topic and, and uh, certainly something that we all have experience with in one way or another because of the pandemic. Um, but let's look at policy now. And so Hazel, if you'll bring in our second polling question, the question is, for international remote work or work from anywhere, does your organization already have a policy in place for international remote work, work from anywhere? The, please select one. The answer is yes, we had a remote work policy prior to the pandemic. Yes, we've recently added it during this time. Uh, C is no, we are working on creating a policy. It's being planned. And D is no, this is not going to be an option in my organization as far as I know. Uh, post pandemic going forward. So if you would just pick one of those that most closely reflects your uh, organization or, or your view on um, policy and international remote work. And Elizabeth, you shared a little bit about what is already happening at Standard Chartered that was happening before, before the pandemic started. Um, so let's get the uh, responses in and then we will um, bring you all in to, to share where your organizations are with this, um, uh, with this topic. Hazel, let me know, you can bring in the responses as soon as they've stopped coming in. Um, but, you know, clearly, well, let's take a look at the responses. Here they are. So 29% of you said we already had this, pol this policy in place before um, in terms of international remote and work from anywhere. 
16% uh, said we've just recently added the policy. Another 24% said that it's under development. So that's 40% um, of you that either have just added it or are in the process of adding it. Um, and then 32% of you, about a third said in, in our organization, that's probably not gonna happen at least at this time, that's not what we're seeing. Um, so, you know, clearly domestic remote work for many functions has staying power and, and you know, under the umbrella of that is flexible, um, flexible work or, you know, I've been a virtual employee at Crown and in my previous jobs, my, almost my entire career. So some people have been remote uh, naturally or it has happened in the past and it definitely has benefits for recruiting and retaining talent. Um, and also for lowering a company's overhead property expenses, certainly. And now during the pandemic for keeping offices safe. Um, but work for anywhere and international remote work has so many risks and, and limitations and costs in terms of tax, immigration, tracking employees, pension, health insurance, payroll, just to name a few. Um, so there's the pros and the cons there. So Mira, Share with us what's going on with, at TWE and in your mobility strategy in terms of remote work, work from anywhere. Is it a conversation? What, what's happening with this topic? Yeah, absolutely. So earlier this year, I would say around May, we launched um, a global Find Your Flex policy and the starting point within that policy, which was um, developed by our talent and capability team was flex. The answer is yes, unless there are barriers that make it a no. Um, so off the back of that, we very quickly developed a Flex Anywhere International policy because the questions are coming in thick and fast. Um, and and I, I think, I guess I've got two probably comments to make with that. Um, we certainly do um, encourage and um, allow employees to work flexibly, whether they, they be um, cross-border for, um, you know, temporary or, perm or permanent um, situations. Um, there are obviously a number of things to consider um, outside tax and immigration there's do we have the technology capability for people to be able right. to do effectively and efficiently do we need real connectivity between the teams what does it mean from a time zone perspective what does it mean from a work-life balance perspective for the employees so we've tried to factor all of these things outside tax and immigration into the equation um, i guess the other point that i wanted to make is while organizations i think are starting to embrace flex and remote working across borders i don't think that tax systems across the world have really caught up to this and so we do still continue to have these barriers and these challenges. Um, I think in being able to accommodate these arrangements because of the restrictions that we have with regulations around the world. Absolutely, and you're bringing up really good points. And I think about even just remote duty of care and what does that look like? How do we define it? And duty of care has so many different angles to it. Um, absolutely, uh, absolutely true. Um, Elizabeth, talk to us a little bit about, I think you already do have, as you mentioned in the previous um, topic that you already had a slide, a slide, you already had a policy in, um, and it was employee initiated, but tell us a little bit more about what's happening at Standard Charter. Mm. So um, I think it's um, it's important to differentiate between flexible working, remote working, which is in an employment country, and then a cross border. Uh, remote uh, or, or flex working because certainly in my organization uh, either consciously or subconsciously some people get the two kind of uh, mixed up so like a lot of organizations uh, my company has had the ability to work from home uh, work uh, reduced hours uh, or flexible hours, job share, all of those kinds of uh, different ways of, of, of managing a role. Um, have, they've been around for a long time, right? And, um, you know, my, uh, my, my, my company's had that, but we're an organization of over 85,000 people, and yet the take-up was roughly always hovering around 20, 25%. Uh, COVID has changed that quite dramatically um, and, and as a, an offshoot of that um, and this is again just talking about in your employment country so we're not overseas yet um, that the bank has, has looked to um, kind of restart uh, the conversation about what, what flexible working could mean uh, and this is under a project which they call future of work now. 
Um, mm -hmm. And the idea is that, um, you know, rather than this idea that, you know, people work from home only in certain situations, um, you know, uh, one day a week, whatever, maybe some people will work from home five days a week and never come into the office. Some people want to still come into the office. What Some people want a hybrid. Um, and in some of our locations, actually, what we need are hubs rather than offices. Um, so um, mm -hmm. these could be conveniently placed so that people closer to their homes could commute in uh, and have that face-to-face -face time with colleagues rather than everyone having to go to the same office uh, to achieve that. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got that we've got that going uh, and a, put, uh, a pilot is starting in February um, which I'm going to be involved in my, uh, because I'm in Singapore. Uh, and I'm, I'm, for example, going to choose to work from home three days a week and go into the office two days a week. So that's going to be my election for the year. Uh, that's that. Um, in terms right. of international, um, right. we only have right now this personal request to work abroad, which we've had for about three years. Uh, and it's supposed to be ad hoc and temporary. It's, it's you know, I'm taking a holiday back to my country of nationality um, and I want to add some work days. Maybe you've got an office and some local colleagues and you want to use this as an opportunity to pop in and see them, uh, but obviously not use your own time in which to do that. Uh, another scenario might be, you know, a parent maybe they've become ill, uh, you need to go and help them for a little while, and you want to be able to go and do that, but also, you know, meet your, your uh, role commitments and job commitments. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have that program. Um, for anybody, if you've got no reason, particularly, you just want to go overseas, and you just want to work, um, we can give you up to 15 business days, so three weeks that you can add to leave uh, to, you know, create a, a a chunk of time to be working elsewhere and we have a number of rules I mean the first thing is you have to have the independent right to work we're not going to get a visa for you right uh, and if you pass all of that uh, we've got all of our stakeholders uh, in all of our compliance pillars involved um, then you get the days and, and you know, have, a, have a good trip uh, what we don't have so far uh, is a uh, work uh, flexible working across a border that's long term or, or permanent in nature Mm -hmm. So um, you want to go and work in, you know, your home in Paris for a week. Fine. You want to do that every Friday forever. We don't have that. Um, right. Now, that's not to say that we're not going to have it. But at the moment, we don't have the appetite for that um, because uh, we've got some other fish to fry. Um, so we're looking at it in the background, but we're not looking to launch it anytime soon. Um, and, and I suspect that we will actually, by the very nature of the kind of organization we are, we have a lot of regula regulatory uh, obligations put on us. Um, it's likely that if we ever get to that point, uh, it will be for fairly controlled conditions uh, and, and, um, uh, and situations, as opposed to you can just go to Hawaii and randomly start working there because that's just where you fancy living. We don't, I don't think we're going to, to have that next year, for example. But right. maybe one day. Well, it could be the future, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. Mira, Mira, do you want to add anything in terms of uh, what Elizabeth was talking about or, or in terms of the, the, that flexible? So yeah, did I you mean, have... go ahead. Sorry, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. I think, I guess what I was going to say is that um, similar to Elizabeth's program, uh, we're really at this point focusing on employee-initiated remote working. Mm -hmm. right? So another important factor that we have is also just trying to ensure where possible that it's cost neutral for the company. Um, right. And I think that is a bit of a challenge in some ways because there's so many, like you, you want the policy to be there and you want it to work, but at the same time, you don't want it to end up costing more for the company when um, it's an employee-related decision. So particularly, I think, you know, where we've got people that want to go and work remotely for compassionate reasons or because their um, spouse has got an assignment in another location and they're two examples that I've had in the last six months. Um, right. I mean, you want to make it work. Otherwise, they're not going to work for the company anymore. Um, but, yeah, it is, it is a challenge. It's a push-pull. It is, and just understanding where what you know what the um, compliance and the risks are and the costs are. I mean, even a colleague of mine recently um, went, flew home because it had been 18 months and they had been with family and need to go home uh, to 
uh, went home and uh, crossed borders, but realized that they needed to buy some personal health care for coverage for while they were on yeah. away on that trip because they were going to be doing some work as well. And the amount of time that they were going to be there, their coverage back in the UK where they're based on their assignment um, wasn't going to cover them. So, I mean, even knowing to ask those questions and to think about those uh, mm -hmm. issues as well. Um, well, I mean, there is so much to, to think about that with that. And uh, the trend that I am seeing is that it is the employee initiated um, assignments and that they are temporary um, is, is what we've seen the most of so far and that assumption that it's an employee request. So more on that, we're going to be talking about it a lot um, in the coming year. And we're going to ask you all for an update uh, as you go into pilots and trying new things and putting together um, policies on this. Um, so before we move ahead, uh, what I would like to do is to take a minute and to um, just ask you, I, I would be remiss if we flew through our session today and didn't talk about the fact that we're all speaking new, a new language or two as a result of what this year has meant for us. Um, and uh, we need to just touch on that for a second and all the new vocabulary that 2020 has brought to us. So each year, as many of you know, the Oxford Dictionary chooses one word of the year and this year they've said that there were just too many. There were too many concepts, too many new words. For the first time, they couldn't come up with one. Although pandemic was there, infodemic was certainly there. Um, for mobility in our industry, I do think that virtual assignment was our concept of the year that everyone started talking about pretty early on, um, trying to figure out what it was. It, we were looking for things to talk about and virtual assignment came up there. Um, but uh, in terms of your own experiences and going through this, I just would like for you to share with us, whether it's something in your house, something with your team, something at work uh, that caught your attention, it can be funny or it can be just the reality of what it was, but what would you choose to put on your, in your word bubble for your word or phrase of the year? Um, and Elizabeth, I'm gonna start with you this time. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, my official word is probably going to be uh, resilience um, okay. because um, uh, I, I'm constantly being told to be resilient and I found myself constantly telling other people to keep up their resilience. Uh, the reality is probably I've said, uh, please shut the door a hundred million times <laughs> this year. Um, stuck in my stuck in my spare room and having people wandering in and out I'm constantly can you just shut the door <laughs> on your way out so um, uh, yeah but that's more a phrase than a than a than a word so I, I'm right. going to go with resilience <laughs> okay resilience well as you can see from the bubble that's on the screen there are plenty of words there and right. people want to chat in and type in their words as well what about for you Mira um, I also have two because I couldn't choose okay uh, in terms of phrases that I've used the most in a work context, I'm going to say it's you're on mute. Um, yeah, and I've got that here on the mine as well. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then I think a word that is very, I, I read it in an article and I totally agree, is a very Australian term, it's ISO. So we've moved isolation um, into ISO. So we now do all ISO things, oh. ISO baking, ISO exercise, ISO Netflix whatever. Um, yeah. Good one. Oh, that's great. Very that's deep. a good one as well. <laughs> ISO. Well, I put up there Sani because I heard that that was something that was uh, very um, uh, uh, Aussie to say. Um, I've got my oh, I haven't heard that, but and... Karen did make me laugh. Um, I think. Yeah. <laughs> that was new. That's definitely new this year. And I have several friends named uh, Karen who um, have not appreciated the fact that their name is, uh, even if they spell it differently, is different. All right, let's move on to polling question number three. Um, and let's start to look forward because, you know, we've been reflecting on what this year has been like, what are some of the activities that you've been um, involved in, some of your priorities. So we're pulling up question number three, polling question number three, and that's just taking a look ahead. Um, so as soon as borders open, here we've had a week where we've, vaccines have started rolling out in the UK and Canada in a few places, um, and we have hope 
there in terms of 2021. As soon as borders open up, which assignment types are going to be most important to your business partners for you to be ready to initiate? What are the ones that you think are, are and you can select all that apply. We have split family, commuter, permanent transfer, long-term assignments, short-term assignments, or other. And you'll notice I haven't put virtual assignment on there because um, we're talking about when borders reopen and getting excited about things that we haven't had in front of us. Um, so which ones are going to be, you think are in the pipeline right now, even though for both of your organization, you've still been mo moving people during this time. But mm -hmm. when we know that borders are open, which ones are going to be, um, are going to be most prevalent or most requested based on your conversations that you've been having with your business partners around needs um, and around what's waiting in the, in, in the background for the, the borders to reopen. Um, so Hazel, as soon as you've got some responses, bring them in. Um, and let's see what people said. So permanent transfers and long-term assignments are the ones that of course are dependent on the borders reopening and they're the ones that are most, most, uh, most popular in terms of anticipating what the, the volume will be. Um, and then we have uh, short-term assignments pretty close behind there. Um, you know, Elizabeth, Standard Charter, you've, you've had uh, moves happening all along. And from my conversations with some of your colleagues, you have you know, you, you have employees who are ready to go, who are not afraid to move forward and are actually really looking forward to it. And I know some companies are concerned about the barriers that the pandemic will bring to getting people to go. Um, but I don't think that's the case for you. Um, but share with us a little bit about which assignment types are urgently being anticipated by your business partners. What's in the pipeline? Um, uh, I think you're right. I, I, I don't think as an organization, um, it's put us off um, mobility. Um, I think, however, to be fair and to preface what I think is going to happen, um, I think it has given people pause for thought. Whereas before, because I've heard more than once people saying, you know, we moved because we were only a, a flight away from our elderly parents or what have you. Uh, and so if something did happen, we, we knew we could just get back. Uh, and I think for some people, it may give them um, a pause or, or food for thought about how far that they're willing to go. So they're still willing to go, but are they willing to go to the other side of the world anymore? Um, but I, I, like most things, I'm kind of wondering whether that will be quite quickly forgotten the, the sooner we go back to travel at will. The memory. Uh, the memory yeah, will be you know, <laughs> how yeah. people are, right? So um, I, I would say um, we would definitely get, um, oh, well, not definitely, I'm expecting a little rush of, of, of the permanent transfers. Um, people maybe who we would have started to talk about at the tail end of this year and that conversation has been shelved depending how fast borders open next year those conversations could just resurface uh, mm -hmm. and so these were people who we've just put them on ice rather than brand new moves per se um, after that um, you know I would imagine actually a, a little bit of a rise of an STA it only only because we saw an appetite for that anyway within the organization um, because we are seeing um, more and more trends of um, particularly at our more senior level of people not bringing their families anymore um, uh -huh. and that could Split just family. just as like yeah, that, that's quite popular um, for us. Um, and, and I'm wondering whether, you know, we will continue to, to see that develop and whether COVID would actually accelerate that decision for more families um, than it would have otherwise. I mean, I'm going to stop you there and ask Mira to chime in with TWE and what you're seeing um, uh, and in terms of what you anticipate with, uh, with moves coming up with borders reopening. Thanks. Um, this was a tricky question for me, to be completely honest, because I think that the future is still relatively quite unknown, despite the fact that I've probably been considering this question for the better part of 10 months. Um, I'll tell you what I answered, which was permanent transfers and short-term assignments. And I guess I, there's two reasons for that. I'll start with um, short-term assignments. I think with a business that has quite a large supply um, arm to it, um, 
there are certain roles that it's very difficult to do remotely um, and, and it's best served face-to-face. -face. We typically will send employees overseas for our harvest or vintage seasons and I would expect that would start to open up again um, once we have our new cycle of, of harvest next year. Um, and permanent transfers, my other choice, I won't say second choice, um, was there because I think it is a growing um, of a growing trend for relocations. I think historically where we used to send people on long-term assignments, you know, full fat equalised packages um, that are starting to, you know, drop away more and more is, is probably the case for other organisations. And I think that in this changing, ever-changing business world, three years is a long time and why would we send somebody right. on a fixed-term three-year assignment when the reality is that they'll probably either stay for longer than that or they'll move to another permanent role in a new location. Well, that and that's one of the trends that we, you know, have talked about the past few years is just the consecutive assignments um, and the fact that, you know, th in three years, what a difference that can make to an organization to where your priorities are um, and more of the consecutive, maybe, you know, uh, uh, local to local or as local as you can get um, kinds of moves as well are uh, more the, the mainstream, not, not saying you don't have the traditional, but that there are fewer and fewer. And we definitely are seeing that in certain industries and in certain, um, in certain organizations. Um, and you know what, it's so helpful for us to, for a, a company like Crown and many of our peers to anticipate the, you know, what's happening in your own organizations and where things are gonna start and where you need us to be. So I think that for all of you on the call today or, or in the audience, who are from the side of the uh, the partner side and the supplier side, it's very helpful for us just to hear what different companies are talking about and where your priorities are for sure. Um, so we're now gonna go right, right into one of our final polls here. And it's on a topic that is very dear to many of us. And I know to the three of us here on this panel today, which is diversity mobility. Um, and so we're gonna ask the audience a question about it. Uh, and then we're gonna um, talk about it a little bit and what it has meant because it's also been a huge, had a huge impact this year as well. So um, for the audience, uh, a poll on diversity mobility, which statement best describes your mobility programs DNI strategy today? And you can pick one answer. DNI is a priority in my organization, but not yet on the mobi global mobility agenda. DNI is a priority in my organization. We measure our assignee population's diversity and set targets to increase the diversity in our assignee population. DNI is not a priority in my organization yet. So you have three choices. Um, and uh, as we wait for the, the, the findings to come in, um, you know, this year in 2020, we definitely saw a global reaction in May to the killing of uh, Mr. George Floyd here in the US. But it's an event that really, I think, strengthened a public commitment to social justice, to equity um, on the part of many organizations all over the world and many communities around the world. Um, and the mobility DNI is, uh, is an area that um, we have been doing some research on over the past few years and talking to many of our clients about, and I know you all are talking about it as well. So let's take a look at what the responses are here. Um, to me, no surprise, 71% uh, of you have said that DBNI is a part of your organization, but not yet on the mobility agenda. In 2019, we did research with 100 global companies, and that was what we found a year ago as well, um, that it's definitely a priority on the agenda for more than almost 70% of the companies that we had researched with and done a survey of then. Um, but that it was a much smaller number of companies that have added it formally to their mobility agenda. And yet 80% of companies that we surveyed at that time said that they uh, valued international experience as a, as a stepping stone or as a, as a boost to careers. Um, and it was a requirement in some companies for senior leadership, but they hadn't made the formal link. So I'm really excited to be talking about this year and excited to be talking about it with both of you. Um, Mira, I know that you're on the, the, the Council for Inclusion and Diversity at TWE. Talk to us a little bit about where you are in terms of initiatives or, or looking at diversity and inclusion um, in terms of mobility. Yeah. Um 
So I'm, I'm really proud of the journey that we have at TWE in terms of um, diversity and inclusion. Um, certainly at a global level, it is very much, um, it's front and centre of our TWE game plan, um, which is really our strategy um, for our 2025 vision. Um, it sits smack bang in the middle of our people talent pillar. Um, I think that we're at different journeys around the world, um, certainly more developed in the US, but I think that there has been a greater need for a, a broader IND strategy over in the States for us, and we've definitely embraced that over there. Um, in Australia, and I sit as part of the ANZ IND Council, which is an employee-led council, where we're probably at the start of our journey, and that's I suppose in some ways a bit normal, but um, you know, definitely trying, I think a key focus that we've had is trying to um, broaden our agenda when it comes to diversity. So we've had Twee for She um, as an employee resource group and Twee Pride for an, a few years now, but we're really looking broader than that at the moment and starting to look at um, multicultural diversity as well as um, accessibility or disability, whether that's visible or invisible disability. Um, so really, as I said, like trying to expand our agenda. Um, I know I kind of haven't answered your question because I think in terms of diversity within, in mobility, we're not there yet, but I think that the, we're not there yet because the company is not necessarily there yet. I think it needs to live and breathe as part of, you know, the DNA of the organisation and it needs to not be a question at that level before it gets addressed at a mobility level. And to be honest, my personal thoughts, and I'm probably keen to hear, um, what, what you think about this is if we can live and breathe inclusion and diversity as an organisation as a whole, then almost reviewing it from a mobility perspective in some ways should fall away um, because it's, it's there within kind of, yeah, the, the DNA of the organisation to start with. Well, and I, I would hope so. Elizabeth, I'm going to have you jump in and I would love mm -hmm. to, you know, keep this conversation going a lot, but we, we also have um, time constraints, but uh, Mira, it's definitely something I would love to pick up again. And maybe we just do a panel on this discussion and, and just look at some different ways, uh, different ideas around this concept. Um, Elizabeth, you started us off uh, as you were talking about your priorities and saying that you were bringing it into your strategy. So tell us a little bit about that in terms of mobility and its focus on diversity and inclusion at, the, at Standard Chartered. Yeah, I would I would have to echo what Mira said. Basically, um, you know, um, our approach with IM is is not that we're looking to, um, you know, pull people out uh, and 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 reach targets, but to it's just how we breathe in and breathe out. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in, in terms of our recruitment practices, um, you know, the culture of the organization and so forth, the fact that that person may have a disability or be a woman or um, uh, be LGBTQ or, or whatever, um, uh, in, in addition to their talent, which is why we've hired them, um, is sort of by the by. Um, and um, uh, and I think that's what we're what we're aiming for. So um, we 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 do have it as part of our agenda, but it's within our agenda of. And I I don't know if I'm putting this correctly, so forgive me if I'm I choose my words rather clumsily. But to normalise any of mm -hmm. these groups, uh, and therefore you know one of the steps that we've taken is to go through our documentation and deliberately change the terminology so that it's particularly inclusive. Um, other things that we, we do is um, rather than use the, um, you know, generic he or, uh, you know, the employee as a male, as a catch all, we deliberately make it a woman. Um, so when we're just talking about generically, we, we I insist that everyone says she rather than he. <laughs> um, right. So just little things like that to sort of just kind of normalize the, the, the concept of not everyone can't, not everyone is, you know, male. Da, 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 da. Um, but um, I, I, I think also giving a voice to people within our organization who are, um, you know, interested in those things uh, from, a, from a very personal perspective so that they can help us to understand uh, if we are using the wrong words or if we are uh, forgetting how, you know, our messaging is appearing to somebody who's coming at it from a different perspective. Um, then we're inviting those people to come into our space and, and teach us. Um, how to do it better. 
Well, and I think that's such a critical piece is bringing in people to give to give their their own personal views on it, and also not being afraid to you know make a mistake in the journey. It is a journey, and to try try things out. Um, I I I really love the idea of doing an audit of your mobility program um, uh, guidelines and uh, and communications to see where maybe it is um, you know biased in one way or it represents only part of your organization and not all of it and changing terminology to make sure that it is inclusive as well and you know taking your if you're doing recruitment and selection within your organization using the d having DNI or IND as your DNA, um, looking at the selection process for international assignments, who's being given the opportunity and who isn't. Because we know that over 20 years, um, the number of women on international assignments remains below 20%, about 16%, it, with some exceptions out there, but very few. Um, so we haven't moved ahead there. But then looking at um, other less represented populations. Somebody brought up this year to me um, just the fact that not every facility in every organization is accessible to people who are differently abled or who have um, you know challenges in, and need a special access to their um, to their facilities. So that that would be a great starting point as well to just make sure that the buildings would be accessible if we did send someone on an assignment to that location. Um, there's so much to talk about on this topic, and we are totally running out of time. Um, and so what I'd like to do, I'm not sure, I'm not seeing questions that have come in yet. Um, and so, uh, Hazel, do you, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if I have, I'm not seeing any questions in the Q&A. Yeah, um, it's not there yet. Okay, right. So why don't we wrap up now as we get to the top of the hour here. Um, I want to um, thank both of you for uh, taking time out and being a part of this um, discussion. And I want to remind everyone that if you are using ERC uh, credits and you are trying to renew those, our ID number is 16425, 16425. Um, and I think as we, as we wrap up, I'd like to ask uh, Mira and Elizabeth to share something that you're going to be celebrating here at the end of the year. If you can, in a, in a, in a very brief way, um, share with us something that your team has overcome or that your team has gotten through or, or um, you know, is feeling really proud about in terms of how you've gone through the past 12 months. If you could just pick one example for us um, as a way to close out our, our session today, um, I really um, appreciate hearing that. Um, and Elizabeth, I'll ask you to start just one example of, of something that your team has put in place or overcome or got, I mean, there's so many examples. Is there something that you want to uh, give a shout out to from your team's view? Um, I, I just think um, given that my team have essentially, in my view, had two jobs uh, to do this year, the, the normal day job plus this new uh, you know, uh, uh, program, if you like, um, volume because of, of uh, COVID. Um, and they all turn up and they, you know, obviously there's very few people who haven't been impacted by COVID. Uh, unfortunately, my aunt passed away from, from it uh, earlier this year. So, you know, uh, I think we've all, we all know somebody or, or have a story. Uh, and yet they all turned up, bless them. I've had to actually make them take leave uh, on occasion, just to get some downtime and to use up their leave, um, and I, um, I'm just, you know, proud of um, of the way that they've all pulled in the right direction uh, and done the best things that we uh, that we can. So, uh, somebody in my team was called a Chris Christmas angel the other day because she was able Aww. to reconcile a lady whose husband has been uh, displaced in the UK for most of the year. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, she's just being diagnosed with cancer. So she really needed her husband. And uh, and uh, we successfully got him back eventually. Um, so uh, I think they have been Christmas angels. So it's been great thank from that perspective. You. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I love that, that, that image of a Christmas angel. Mira, tell us a little bit about just some one example of something that you're going to be celebrating with your team this at the here at the end of the year. I think if I can be honest, as much as we know that moving is really stressful for our assignees in previous years, it's become almost, um, you know, quite routine 
in the way that we probably approach it as a function. But I think this year we've really had a renewed focus on the employee experience. Um, you know, moving in 2020 has probably been more stressful than ever. But I think as a team, we've really focused on that and really put care into the way that we manage the needs that we have been managing. Um, so whether that is very regular check-ins with the team. And the reality is that Crown does most of the heavy lifting for us, right? So, you know, we don't need to be linking in with our employees, you know, on a very regular basis, but I think we've really focused on doing so this year to make sure that we've got that connectivity with them at what is a very stressful time. Um, and so it's as simple as phone calls or care packages while they're in quarantine. And we've got two weeks of quarantine in Australia. Um, yeah, we're just, just checking in and making sure that they've got stuff for the kids to play with when they're in, in hotel quarantine um, or whatnot. I think that's probably the thing that I feel most proud about this year. That's fantastic. And just that added, I mean, I think in our industry, we know that that's something that we all, all do is that human touch and that empathy. But this year, you know, how do we ramp it up and how do we take it to another level and really just show I mean, you know, the, the, the stress, the, as you said, it's normal to have stress, but then the added um, anxiety and, and added um, s stress and uncertainty of the, what this year has brought. And that's fantastic to call that out with your, your team as well. And um, thank you both so much for being here. Um, Mira Srinivasan and Elizabeth Keller, we're delighted that you were here to share with us. And we're here at just the top of the hour. Um, so I've put up a QR in our code and I would love for all of you to um, just put your phone up to it and to give us a little bit of feedback that will help us to plan for our next event, which will be coming early in the first quarter of, of 2021. I can't believe we're about to put this behind us, but um, just wanna thank all of you for joining us today. We had one question, Elizabeth, for you. And so I'm gonna um, just ask it very quickly and um, for someone and uh, that way we can get that question out um, because it's very specific to your program um, while okay. people are filling out the QR code. Is that all right, Hazel, to just address that quickly? Yep, sure, absolutely. Okay. So Elizabeth, your 2000 cases under your PRT WAP work from, I guess it's anywhere program. Is it, is it time bound? Is it an assignment? It's time bound, the support that they get? Um, so we have uh, a number of specific categories which are all humanitarian based, uh, such as uh, illness and bereavement, um, force majeure, um, immigration issues where uh, your family has not been able to join you in your employment country. And then we have a generic, uh, no particular rationale. And that is, um, the others are, we're flexible on time, depending on, you know, what, what um, from the compliance pillars, what we're able to give you. Uh, and there's also been uh, this year where we've had uh, exemptions issued by a number of tax authorities. We've taken advantage of those and, and passed them on to our employee to, to give them more time. Um, but uh, if you don't have a specific reason that falls into one of the main categories, then it's just a generic 15 days, um, which you can take, you know, in, uh, consecutively or you can take, you know, um, in between leave to elongate your time as you see fit. Mm -hmm. uh, and we expect you to use that within within the same tax year. Um, so that's the only one that's kind of got a specific time. The others depends on your situation and if um, you you know oh, thanks and you've just started to cut out so with that I'm just gonna to cut cut that off now and hopefully that's um, answered um, most of the, the question that came in and thank you for that question we, we got the one question so I didn't want to uh, for us to leave without answering it um, but to both of you and to all of you out there um, on behalf of Hazel and myself and all of our Crown colleagues, we definitely are sending you wishes for a safe and sane and joyful, unique, hopefully, once in a lifetime um, holiday that we're about to embark on that will be different from any other holiday. So mm -hmm. we just thank you all for being here and to stay well. And we look forward to seeing you in 2021. Thanks, Lisa. Same to you. Take care. Thank you, Thanks Lisa. So thank you, everyone, Bye. for joining. Take care. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye.